morning from Denver, Colorado. Uh, today I'd like to present my paper uh, titled Migrant Climate in the Kino Scene. Um, in this uh, intervention, I'd like to put forward five theses on the topic of Anthropocene mobilities. My aim is not to unpack every concept contained in this article, but rather to provide a provocative introductory synthesis of five uh, key ideas or five theses on Anthropocene mobility. Uh, the first thesis is that we're living in what I call the Kino scene, uh, an age of mobility. Um, number two, the ontology of our time, I want to argue is an ontology of motion. Uh, number three, I'd like to argue that we need a new movement-oriented political theory to grapple better with the mobile events of our time. We need what I call a Kino politics. Um, number four, I'd like to argue that climate change is a weapon of what Marx calls primitive accumulation. And number five, the Kino scene presents us with the danger of new forms of domination including a new colonialism, a new climate capitalism, new forms of states and new borders, but also with the opportunity for a new revolutionary sequence. So the first thesis is that we are living in what I call the Kino scene. We live in an age of movement. I mean this in the directly materialist sense in which huge amounts of materials are now in wide circulation around the globe. There are more humans circulating and consuming more large cultivated animals and calorie yielding plants than ever before. Life is one of the most efficient maximizers of entropy on earth and humans have increased their entropic impact by further burning fossil fuels, overproduction, overproducing nitrogen fertilizers and removing forests and increasing net carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Portions of the planet are literally moving more quickly and more unevenly around axes of gender, race, and class. The widespread use of global transportation technology, for example, also means that more people and things are on the move on the surface of the earth than ever before. The earth is becoming so mobile that even its glaciers are on the move. Karl Marx was not thinking of receding glaciers, but I think it's safe to say that all that was solid is today literally melting into air as carbon dioxide. Mobility is not something happening just to humans. More than half the world's plants and animal species are also on the move, migrating. This movement as a whole, and not merely the geological impact of humans alone on a layer of strata, geological strata, is why I think the Anthropocene and the Capitalocene are only subcategories of a much larger kinetic transformation of the earth currently underway. Humans might have initiated this increase in movement and capitalism certainly hastened it, but now the whole planet is producing positive feedback cycles, carbon cycles, nitrogen cycles, etc., that have their own lives, their own mobility that needs to be acknowledged as part of this era. Although the term Anthropocene will likely stay with us as a productive term of contestation, it has a rather paradoxical meaning. The Anthropocene means not only that humans are parts of a larger entangled geological and planetary process, but also that the use of the term Anthropos suggests that humans are somehow distinct enough from those processes to have their own special epoch. This is why Donna Haraway, for example, prefers the unwieldy term Cthulhucene to describe the tentacular entanglement of Earth's processes with one another, thus partially undermining the very idea that there can be a sole independent single cause of an epoch, a geological epoch. The Earth and all its processes, including humans, always have been in motion and entangled. So historically, we're dealing with a matter of degree. However, I do think we can say that today, uh, there are more minerals, including those inside human bodies, uh, that are in circulation on the surface of the earth um, uh, than, than ever before. We thus are witnessing one of the most mobile geological strata of earth's history, what I call the Kino scene. The next uh, short thesis is that the ontology of our time is an ontology of motion. We know there's nothing in the universe which is not in motion. The Roman poet Lucretius 
was the first to put forward such an idea in the first century B BCE, but physicists have come to the same conclusion only recently. Most philosophers and scientists for the past 5,000 years have posited God, eternity, mind, the absolute, and other static ideals, uh, idealist abstractions at the heart of being instead of motion. It was not until Edwin Hubble's 1924 discovery that the universe is expanding that the last great proponent of the static universe, Albert Einstein, was forced to admit, quote, the biggest blunder of his life, as he called it, which was that he believed that the universe was static and it turned out that it was not. The knowledge of an increase in historical planetary mobility at every level and the recent discovery of similarly increasing mobility in the expansion of the universe itself are two of the most profound historical conditions under which it is now possible today to describe a new historical ontology of motion. However, by its nature, such an ontology can't be strictly ontological, historical, or epistemological in their traditional senses, but must entail all three at once, what we might say historico-onto-epistemological. In other words, the kinetic emergence of epistemic practices about the movements of the earth, um, climatology, sociology, geology, biology, um, and the universe, cosmology, astronomy, quantum physics, etc., are historically entangled with the, tr the ontological transformation of the earth itself. Those sciences are things that we do during a time at which everything is increasingly in motion. Um, and that makes those knowledges, those, those, those kinds of inquiries possible in the first place. In other words, our knowledge transformations, uh, sorry, our knowledge practices do not occur in a vacuum, but are situated and entangled with the very kinetic transformations that they're observing. This is why the ontology of motion must be a strictly historical ontology of the present and not a description of the true nature of being everywhere and for all time. Knowing is an ontologically real transformative activity. Knowing is something that we do. Uh, it's not a representation of the world. Therefore, on this point, I see a divergence between this idea of a historical ontology of movement um, and what today is called vitalist new materialism. Uh, there are three differences that I just wanna highlight. Uh, the first one is that an ontology of motion by definition cannot be universal. Um, it's not a universal description of being, even if it takes the paradoxical form of an ontology of becoming, uh, as, you know, some, as the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze describes it. Um, but I find that to be ahistorical um, and metaphysical. Um, to describe all of being forever and all time as becoming. An ontology of motion, to my mind, must be historically, geologically, and kinetically situated without any pretensions to universality. It must be firmly rooted in the epoch of the Kino scene. Uh, number two, uh, if vitality in the vitalist new materialism is meant to explain the cause of motion, then it is, by definition, not an ontology of motion since it subordinates movement to something else, namely vital forces. If on the other hand, what is meant by vitality is nothing other than motion itself, then I see no reason to continue using uh, such a biocentric pseudonym since it only confuses what is really at stake, namely matter in motion. Uh, number three, the third difference um, is that the meaning of the Anthropocene uh, cannot be identical to the ontology of becoming. Because being, according to the ontology of becoming, is all, al already, always, and everywhere equally becoming, regardless of historical epochs. That's why it's, a, it's an ahistorical idea. Uh, from this perspective, there's nothing more or less special or revealing about the Anthropocene. Um, so there's nothing about our historical period that changes or in any way reflects the fact that being has always becoming. The real question for me, though, is whether uh, is what are the geohistorical and kinetic conditions for the emergence of contemporary ontological descriptions in the first place? What is the world like such that it makes those descriptions possible? This leads to a historical ontology and not ontology per se, with capital O. In particular, I worry that ontological vitalism projects onto the whole of nature what is in fact only a tiny and contingent fraction of it, namely life. This is why I think analyzing unequal patterns of movement, 
and not vitalist flat ontologies should be the historical ontology of our time. Okay, next thesis is that we need a new movement-oriented political theory to grapple better with the mobile events of our time. We need what I call a Kino politics. The advent of the Kino scene makes possible today the radical insight that nature, humans, and society always have been in motion. Humans are and have always been fundamentally migratory, just as the climate and earth always have been fundamentally migrant and mobile. These twin insights might sound obvious today, but if taken seriously, they offer a complete inversion of the dominant interpretation and interpretive paradigms of the climate and migration crises. Humans and the earth always have been in motion, but not all the patterns are the same. There is no natural, normal, or default state of the earth or human society. Therefore, we have to study the patterns of circulation that make possible these metastable states and not treat them as pre-given or natural. This is the task of the new, of, of what I'm calling Kino politics. Unfortunately, the dominant framework for thinking about the climate and migrant crises is currently upside down. It starts from the perspective of a triple stasis. First, that the earth and human society are in some sense separable from one another and that they're static or at least stable structures. Two, that the future should continue to be stable as well. And three, that if there is not stability, then there is crisis. Mobility then is a crisis only if we assume that there was or should be stasis in the first place. For example, migrants are said to destabilize society and climate change is said to destabilize the earth. From a Kino political perspective, we can see that the opposite is in fact true. Humans were first migratory and only later settled into more metastable patterns of social circulation. Historically possible, of course, by social expulsion and the dispossession of, of others. Migrants are not outside society, but have played a productive and reproductive role throughout history. Migrant movements are constitutive and even transformative rather than exceptional. The real question is how we ever came to act and think as if societies were not processes of social circulation that relied on migrate migration as their conditions of reproduction. The earth too was first migratory and only later did it settle into metastable patterns of geological and atmospheric circulation. For example, the Holocene. Why did we ever think of the earth as a stable surface immune from human activity in the first place? The problem with the prevailing interpretation of climate change and migration is that the very condition of the designation and cause of the crisis, i.e. stasis, is being proposed as the solution to this same crisis. The most frequent formulation of these two problems is how can we stop things from moving using borders, new laws, eco-friendly products, etc. In short, I think a new paradigm is needed that does not use the same tools that generated the crisis to solve it, i.e. capitalism, colonialism, and the nation state. Today's migrant crisis is a product of the paradox at the heart of the capitalist territorial nation state form, just as the climate crisis is an expression of the paradox at the heart of anthropocentrism. The solutions, therefore, will not come from the forms in crisis, but only from the birth of new forms of motion that begin with the theoretical primacy of the very thing that is dissolving the old ones, namely the mobility of the migrant climate. Okay, the next thesis is that climate change is a weapon of primitive accumulation. Climate change has disproportionately negative effects on poor countries and people of color and disproportionately positive effects on receiving countries that benefit from hyper exploitable and precarious labor what I call a, quote, reserve climate labor army. This asymmetry is the result of a long history of capitalist colonialism and violence, which continues now through the bordered management of migration. Thus, contemporary global migration cannot be reduced to merely natural climactic causal explanations. The figure of the so-called climate refugee is never simply fleeing climate change, but is doing so under post-colonial conditions of geopolitical violence and racism. The term climate refugee itself serves to cover over the real Kino political conditions of social circulation 
at work that make such populations vulnerable to displacement in the first place. So climate change is a weapon of primitive accumulation, or what I would call expansion by expulsion, because it expands Western power by forcibly expelling people from their previous patterns of motion and appropriating them into its own conditions of social reproduction. This expulsion is fourfold. Uh, migrants lose the right to their land and homes, a kind of territorial expulsion. They lose the right to full civic participation, political expulsion. They lose their right to legal status. This is juridical expulsion. And they lose their right to the means of production or subsistence, economic expulsion. This fourfold expulsion is the necessary condition for the direct appropriation of vulnerable and cheap migrant bodies and for the expansion of capitalist eco-racism. Nationalism, xenophobia, and racism also play a structural role in the process of primitive accumulation because they socially devalorize and thus cheapen the labor and lives of migrant workers. If migrants arrived but were not thoroughly racialized and discriminated against, their labor would be too valuable for capitalist investment to bother appropriating them in the first place. Thus, capitalism wields climate change under a triple condition of eco-colonialism. Uh, this is the triple condition. One, that the historical origins of recent climate change are in colonialism itself, oil from Africa, industrial production from slavery, and so on. Two, that colonized populations and indigenous people are disproportionately forced to move because of climate change. And three, these same populations are racialized as, quote, dangerous barbarian boat people upon arrival. But climate change, like primitive accumulation, is not just about the dispossession and appropriation of people and cheap labor. It is also about the direct appropriation of cheap or free land. The two go hand in hand and have done so since the, before the rise of capitalism. At the same time that, the cli that climate change displaces people, it also opens up previously occupied lands, waters and forests to new privatized, extractive uh, and constructive industries. As the climate changes, previously inaccessible areas will be opened up for expanding new markets, supplied with abundant cheap migrant labor, including new security markets for borders, fences, walls, drones. Think of the privatization and gentrification of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina but on a much larger scale. In other words, climate change might not, uh, might not mean the end of capitalism, but might in fact herald its rebirth or second wind. If capitalism loves disaster, why should we think climate change will necessarily mean the end of capitalism? If anything can be commodified, there is no absolute natural limit to capitalism, only relative limits to profit. We are most certainly at the cusp of one of these limits today, which Jason Moore attributes to, quote, the tendency of the ecological surplus to fall. In other words, everything and everyone that could be appropriated easily, oil, slaves, old growth forests, etc., was gobbled up during colonialism. The workers who are left today want more money and more rights. The minerals, are, uh, the minerals left are more expensive to extract. This is why capitalists have increasingly retreated to financial speculation. If only there were a way the capitalist dreams to somehow cheaply dislodge huge numbers of people from their land, devalorize their labor, and appropriate it. In other words, if climate change didn't exist, it would be necessary for capitalism to create it. Lucky for it, it does, because it did. Migrants today, as Marx says, form a disposable industrial reserve army, which belongs to capital just as absolutely as if the latter had bred it at its own cost. Okay, final thesis. Uh, the Kino scene presents us <clears throat> with the danger of new forms of domination, uh, but also with the opportunity for a new revolutionary sequence. The fact that our planet is on the move more than ever before has made it possible for us to see quite dramatically that society always has been on the move together with nature. The Kino scene shows us that there is no natural stable state of nature and no natural stable social state. All stabilities are produced by processes of metastable patterns of circulation that could be otherwise than they are. The figure of the migrant is thus both a historical product of bordering practices and the transhistorical condition for their transformation. <clears throat> 
This is why I think we should resist doom mongering and climate reductionistic impulses to stockpile and securitize our societies against our neighbors because survival supposedly demands it. The post-apocalyptic imagination of the doom monger is largely a vision of the present racist, classist, and exclusionary, securitized, eco-aspirational world projected onto a future in which the evils of the world have perished in the flood. If we stockpile now, we will be ready to protect it from everyone else later in the climate wars. The typical migration as adaptation alternative uh, is, is not much better than this, first, than this earlier one. In this future, the story goes, displaced migrants will creatively fend for themselves in novel and resilient ways. Uh, they can send remittances, live cheaply, care for themselves, invent new techniques of subsistence, and so on, while the rest of the world remains securitized and relies periodically on this surplus climate labor army. Um, I agree with some scholars that experimentation and resilience are necessary, but I would want to add to what they've said here, uh, which is that only resilience is, is, is good only if this experimentation is part of a larger anti-capitalist cosmopolitan and decolonial project. That's what would make resilience genuinely revolutionary. If not, then resilience and adaptation risks simply repeating the current neoliberal model of structural adjustment that relies on resilience to subsidize the removal of social services, um, uh, insufficient wages, and ecological destruction. Capitalism, before neoliberalism, long has relied on the ability of the dispossessed and the unemployed to support themselves until capital is ready to exploit them again when the market picks up. This is nothing new. So without offering any kind of specific program, I think there are at least three important but not entirely sufficient conditions for any future resistance to climate capitalism. First, it seems hard to imagine, at least for me, any genuine human ecological emancipation without the abolition of capitalism and the private ownership of the means of natural, social, metabolic reproduction. Instead of stockpiling and hoping that the dispossessed will be creative enough to survive climate change, perhaps migrants potential migrants, indigenous peoples, and their allies should be organizing themselves now to recapture the metabolic means of reproduction from the capitalists and wealthy nation states producing the so-called crisis in the first place. There is no need for a party or vanguard in this strategy, but simply a globally coordinated effort alongside shared experimental struggles for federated autonomy. Second, another important condition of climate resistance is that the we of political experimentation should be as inclusive and non-hierarchical as possible. We might call this second condition migrant cosmopolitanism, in part because it is almost always uh, migrants, the migrants of history, nomads, barbarians, vagabonds, lumpen proletariat, who have been the most creative in their resistance to Kino political domination. It is from the expelled and dispossessed populations of the world that the most radical creativity and indignation have come and are likely to come again, i.e. from below and to the left, as the Zapatistas say. Migrant cosmopolitanism is not a utopian state, but a process of increasing social inclusion. As such, it ultimately entails a move away from the current nation state model of social organization. The global migrant justice movement, no one is illegal, for example, is already headed in this direction. Number three, all the resilience in the world will not lead to real emancipation unless the colonial and post-colonial causes of global inequality and forced migration are removed. The North American Free Trade Agreement, the International Monetary Fund, structural adjustments, foreign ownership, and others. Any future resistance that not, is not explicitly anti-capitalist cosmopolitan and decolonial risks perpetuating the long legacy of racist, sexist, and classist exploitation at the historical and contemporary core of the current migrant climate. I realize this is an ambitious proposal and that the micro and macro dynamics of Kino political resistance can't be spelled out in such a short uh, paper like this without being seriously underdeveloped. Instead, I would like to just highlight at least one concrete historical movement that has actually been headed in these directions since 1994. That is the Zapatista uprising in Chiapas, Mexico. I'm not saying that this movement succeeded in solving all of their problems or ours, only that they've been struggling in the right direction for a long time and we should pay attention. 
Over the past 20 years, their effort has continuously developed, uh, directly influencing some of the largest global solidarity movements in recent history the Alter Globalization Movement, the Occupy Movement, the World Social Forum, and Via Campesina, to name only a few of the largest. Cooperative economics, collective commons, ecological responsibility, migrant justice work, indigenous feminism, horizontal global solidarity strategies, consensus decision-making, and many other tactics have provided and can still provide inspiration for further experimentation in the emerging context of the Kino scene and capitalist climate change. Zapatismo is not a utopian cure-all. It is not a model to be copied, but it continues to provide the world with inspiration and resonance with some useful tactics and methods. It remains one of the most daring attempts in recent history to meld anti-capitalist politics, radical cosmopolitanism, and decolonial struggle. Furthermore, the Zapatistas have done so in the face of constant violence by the Mexican government paramilitary groups, and neo-colonial extraction efforts. Under threat of Kino political domination, they fought to move and circulate in their own way. To my mind, they're essentially, uh, they're essential precursors for whatever resistance comes next, uh, to help weave together a world in which many worlds fit, as the Zapatistas say. Thank you for listening. <laughs>